Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Fiore, and I'm really happy today to introduce Dr. Linda M. Collins, mm -hmm. Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences and Professor of Biostatistics in the School of Global Health at New York University. Dr. Collins' research is focused on developing, disseminating, and applying the multi-phase optimization strategy known as MOST, an engineering-inspired methodology framework for optimizing and evaluating behavioral, biobehavioral, and social structural interventions, including tobacco control interventions. The objective of MOST is to improve intervention effectiveness, affordability, scalability, and efficiency. Tim Baker and I first met Dr. Linda Collins more than 15 years ago over lunch at a DC area restaurant. She described to us most in its power to efficiently advance science. That lunch had a profound impact on the two of us and on our science. Dr. Collins, in part as a result, has been an investigator since that time on three consecutive National Cancer Institute program project grants that Tim and I lead. As importantly, Dr. Collins in most has changed the way we conceptualize and conduct our science. Linda, you have powerfully informed our work in that of countless investigators in tobacco control and beyond. I am honored to introduce you today for your clinical plenary theme lecture titled Beyond Intervention Effectiveness, What We Need to Achieve Greater Public Health Impact. Dr. Collins. Mike, thank you so much uh, for that nice introduction. And uh, I want you to know, and I think this is probably obvious, that that, that meeting had a profound effect on my work too. Uh, you were the first people to have the courage to take most out for a spin, and I, uh, I'll always be grateful for that. And you and Tim and Robin Mermelstein and Megan Piper have had a lot of influence on my work over the years. So thank you for that. I have no conflicts to disclose and thank you to uh, my, my current sources of funding. Mike uh, gave us the title of my talk, but I just want to point out my email address on this slide and also my, my Twitter handle. I want to start uh, just by quickly going over the NIH stage model uh, for behavioral intervention development. And uh, one reason for that is I'm going to be referring to it today. But another reason is I want to point out why I'm sticking with the term effectiveness rather than, than efficacy today. I'm not going to be making the efficacy effectiveness distinction, partly because I don't want to have to keep saying efficacy or effectiveness, but uh, mostly because it's a continuum, not really um, discrete categories. And we see that uh, in stage three, that's labeled efficacy. And of course, that is evaluating interventions in more realistic community type settings. But um, these trials are often called hybrid efficacy effectiveness trials. So I'm going to be sticking with the term uh, effectiveness today. I'm going to be talking today, of course, about what I believe we need to achieve greater public health impact. And I think it's two things. One, I think we need to be considering affordability, scalability, and efficiency right along with effectiveness from the very beginning of the intervention development process and all the way through. And second, I'm going to propose that we optimize interventions to achieve intervention ease in an iterative process. Here's an overview of my talk today. First, I'm going to uh, explain why I believe it's important to consider affordability, scalability, and efficiency from the outset. I'll talk about how we can achieve intervention ease by means of optimization and describe the multi-phase optimization strategy or most. I'll share with you one possible vision for the future of tobacco use prevention and treatment if some of these ideas are, are adopted. And I'll just end with a few concluding remarks. So 
Here's my pitch for why I believe it's important uh, to consider affordability, scalability, and efficiency from the very outset. Let's review the classical treatment package approach, which is uh, still business as usual in intervention development and evaluation. This is just a, a figure describing a classical treatment package approach. There's a number of components. I have five here, of course, it could be in any number of components. They are usually uh, pilot tested first and then assembled uh, into an intervention package. And that intervention package is evaluated by means of an RCT. The RCT is uh, a really great way uh, to evaluate interventions. Uh, that is to say, to test uh, a hypothesis about whether uh, the intervention as a package performs better than uh, control. But the RCT can assess the performance of the package, not the individual components. And that's going to be uh, important in what I'm going to say next. I want to pause for a moment here to acknowledge the contribution uh, of the treatment package approach to intervention science. It's gotten us from nowhere to where we are today, uh, made a tremendous amount of progress in the hands of some really, really brilliant scientists. At the same time, I'm going to suggest today that maybe we reconsider this approach and try something new. Uh, let's start with affordability. I'm gonna define that as the extent to which the intervention is effective without exceeding any budgetary constraints there might be. So for example, uh, maybe it is known uh, that uh, $300 per person will be reimbursable for an intervention. And so uh, that, that's, a, that's a budget constraint. Today, there's little incentive, I would argue, for US academic intervention scientists to think about uh, how much their interventions cost to implement, that's not, that's not necessarily true in other countries. Uh, it's true in some other countries and, and uh, not, not all though. In my uh, interactions with uh, intervention scientists, I very often ask them if they come to me for experimental design advice. Uh, you know, this intervention looks great. Um, let, let's hope it's successful and would go to scale. And if it did, who do you think would pay for it? And very often they don't know the answer to that question. And to be fair, that's a hard question because it's not always obvious who would pay for an intervention. Now, of course, if the intervention ends up being too expensive, you would need to do something to make it less expensive if it's going to be scalable. So you can try making alterations to the intervention, but this is risky if the classical approach was used. If the classical treatment package approach was used to develop the intervention, you don't know which components are working and which ones aren't you don't know which components contributed to that overall effect that you observed. And so if you start removing components, you can seriously undermine the effectiveness of the intervention. So the consequences here are many interventions are never implemented because they're just too expensive or they're implemented with undermined effectiveness. Now let's consider scalability, which I'll define as the extent to which the intervention can be implemented widely with fidelity. The prevailing logic today in intervention science seems to be first establish effectiveness and then worry about scalability, only then worry about scalability. But what if you establish the effectiveness of the intervention and it turns out not to be scalable? And there's a lot of reasons that could happen. The intervention might be too complicated. It might require more attention than staff can reasonably give it. It might not be cost-effective. There's many, many other possibilities. So again, here, alterations are needed to make uh, the intervention less complicated, uh, for, for example, less demanding of staff time. But again, these alterations can be risky for the same reason I said before, if the classical treatment package approach was used. So the consequences here are, again, many interventions are never implemented because they're really not scalable or practical, or they're implemented, but with undermined effectiveness. Now let's talk about efficiency, which I'll define as the extent to which the intervention avoids wasting time, money, or other valuable resources. An efficient intervention is an intervention that doesn't have any inactive components in it. Let's say you're an intervention scientist, you're developing an intervention using the classical approach. And first, you know you want to get a significant effect in an RCT. Because when you're an academic intervention scientist, that's kind of your job, is to get a significant effect in an RCT. 
We said before, there's really little incentive to consider cost or scalability. Most um, academic intervention scientists really don't worry much about that. And there seems to be, I've observed, an implicit convention that you can include as many inactive or counterproductive components as you want in an intervention, as long as the intervention as a package has a significant effect in an RCT. So the conclusion here is you want to get a significant effect in an RCT. There's really no incentive to consider cost or scalability. And you can include as many component, inactive components as you want. So why not include many, many components in, in the intervention? In fact, I would argue that that's what's been happening. So the consequence here is that many interventions, I would say, likely include useless or possibly even counterproductive components that are eroding the effectiveness of the intervention. So the consequences, I would say, to sum up are that many interventions are too expensive or otherwise impractical. Many have been subject to ad hoc alterations that uh, undermine their effectiveness, and many interventions likely include useless or even counterproductive components that are doing nothing but taking up time and money and burdening participants. So is it any wonder that as Ankin et al. Uh, noted, so many efficacious behavioral interventions do not make their way down the pipeline through implementation. And that's something we all lament uh, and have been lamenting for many years. Okay, now keep that in mind. And I'm going to talk about uh, achieving intervention ease by means of optimization. Intervention ease is a strategic balance of effectiveness, affordability, scalability, and efficiency. And by strategic balance, I mean strategizing to achieve the, the greatest public health impact. I think we all know that if you don't worry about the uh, affordability, uh, scalability, or efficiency of an intervention, you can probably get a larger effect. But if the intervention is never implemented, of course, the net public health impact is zero. So let's, uh, let's agree right now that we are more concerned about public health impact than we are about effectiveness per se. Ease is achieved by balancing, on the one hand, effectiveness against affordability, scalability, and efficiency. But I think I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, uh, that it would be a good idea to do this, but how? How, do you, how can we do this? And I'm going to suggest that by drawing on ideas from engineering, we can use principles of optimization to do this. So let's define optimization and I wanna make a couple of points about it. First, optimization we're gonna define as the process of identifying a strategic balance of effectiveness against affordability, scalability, and efficiency. I would say, uh, I'd like to comment right now, beware the um, colloquial use of the term uh, opt optimize or optimal, uh, because it's often used interchangeably with best. Optimal is not best. Optimization is, about, is not about finding the absolute best, it's about finding the best you can actually use, and that's a huge difference. The absolute best in uh, the intervention world, of course, would be the most effective intervention. But optimized, the optimized intervention is the most effective intervention subject to realistic constraints on willingness to pay for the intervention, on how much staff time is available to implement it, a tolerable level of complexity for staff and participants and lots of other things you can, you can think of. I also wanna point out that there may not be, in fact, often will not be one single optimal intervention. What is optimal may vary across settings and time. And if that seems strange to you, just, just imagine the following. Uh, we're both trying to optimize an intervention. I know that in, in, in my community, willingness to pay is $200 uh, per participant. Maybe in your community, which is more perhaps more resource rich, it's possible to pay $300 per person. Well, I think you can see that the composition of, of the uh, optimized intervention is likely gonna be different in those two scenarios. And that, that's completely natural. This is the multi-phase optimization strategy or most. Uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, walk us through it. 
Uh, first phase is preparation. In this phase, you lay the groundwork for optimization. And uh, here uh, you devise uh, or possibly revise a, a very detailed conceptual model. You identify a set of candidate components, and I'm calling them candidate components because they're candidates for inclusion in the intervention. It's not a foregone conclusion that they're going to be included. They're candidates for inclusion. Any pilot testing is done here in the preparation phase, and uh, you identify an optimization criteria, and I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. The next phase is optimization where you build the optimized intervention. And here you would conduct um, uh, what's called an optimization trial. And there's many different possibilities for the design uh, of the optimization trial. I'm gonna come back to that in a second too. The purpose though of every optimization trial, whatever experimental design you use, is to assess the performance of individual components and also how they may interact with, with each other. That information is essential for optimizing interventions. The final phase is evaluation, where the intervention is, is evaluated, usually in a standard RCT. I want to come back to uh, these different experimental designs. You can see that there's a, a number of different experimental designs listed here. Factorial experiment, the fractional factorial experiment, the SMART, which is the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial, the micro randomized trial, uh, system identification, which is which really comes from a different uh, tradition uh, from those those other experimental experimental designs, and there may be others. The point I want to make here is that those of us who are enthusiasts about intervention optimization, we are not anti RCT. We're pro selecting the experimental design that's appropriate for the research questions that are being asked. When the research questions concern the performance of individual components of an intervention, then um, one of these experimental designs is going to be most useful in most cases. If the question is about evaluating a treatment package, then the RCT is, is the, the right design to use. And I think, you know, we've all been trained as scientists, and I think uh, very, very basic in our training has been no one single experimental design is appropriate for all the different research questions that, that we might have as scientists. I said I'd come back to the optimization criterion. The optimization criterion is your definition of intervention ease. So it's, it's your uh, definition of how you're going to balance effectiveness against these other considerations. And this is where you would specify, for example, an upper limit on willingness to pay. Uh, this is where you would say, for example, uh, I'm going to uh, find uh, the set of components that gives me the most effective, uh, the, the largest effect I can get, but costs under, say, $300 a person to implement. I want to point out that the multi-phase optimization strategy is an iterative approach, and that is really woven through this approach, but I want to point out a couple of places. One is, notice that this says conduct optimization trials, plural. You actually can conduct a series of optimization trials. You, sometimes you would want to do them simultaneously. Other times you can do them in an iterative fashion. For example, you might conduct one optimization trial uh, that would tell you which components are working, and you might want to take out the ones that aren't working and replace them with new ones and, and test those. It's not necessary to do that, but it's an option. And also, I want to point out that you can cycle back without doing an RCT, and there are a number of reasons why you might want to do that, but one is that you just didn't identify enough active components to make up a successful intervention. Now I'm going to re, uh, report to you uh, an example, which is work that I was uh, lucky enough to do uh, in collaboration with, with Mike and Tim Baker and Megan Piper and Robin Mermelstein and uh, a number of others. And Mike, of course, was the uh, principal investigator on this. Uh, and the objective here was to arrive at an efficient smoking cessation intervention made up of all active components. So we were trying to screen out any inactive components. This work was based on Mike and Tim's phase-based model of, of cessation, which I think most of you have probably heard of. We examined 11 components in two different optimization trials uh, that were conducted simultaneously. The results of these trials were uh, reported in these articles that were published in Addiction in 2016. So I'm not gonna go into everything, but I want to just uh, give you a sense of what an optimization trial is like uh, 
So um, let's look at the different components that were in these two optimization trials. So one trial focused on components that pertain to the preparation and cessation phase of, of cessation. And the second uh, optimization trial contained components that pertain to the maintenance phase. One uh, component we looked at was preparation use of nicotine patch, and that could be on or off. And notice that, by the way, that preparation is before actual cessation. In this uh, study, everyone got nicotine replacement starting with the cessation uh, date at least, but some people were given uh, NRT during the preparation phase. Preparation oral NRT in lozenge form, that was on versus could be on or off. Preparation phase counseling could be on or off. Cessation in-person counseling, it could be at a, a lower level or a higher level. Cessation phone counseling, again, could be a higher level or a lower level. And duration of NRT could be 16 weeks or eight weeks. So those, we examined those in a factorial experiment and those were the six factors. In the maintenance phase experiment, we looked at extended use of medication even further, 26 weeks versus eight weeks. Maintenance counseling via telephone could be presented or not presented. Medication adherence counseling could be two 10 minute sessions versus none. Automated medication adherence calls on or off. And then uh, everyone got a helping hands. Uh, it's like a MEMS cap type device, uh, but some people got some extra counseling with that. So we conducted those two uh, experiments to examine the performance of those components. And these were the ones, these were the winners, so to speak. These were the ones that uh, turned out to have detectable effects. Uh, preparation phase, oral NRT, cessation phase, in-person counseling at the intensive level, extended NRT 26 weeks out, medication counseling via telephone, and automated medication adherence calls. So those uh, components were combined into a treatment package. And that was evaluated by means of the standard RCT that was reported in the Annals of Behavioral Medicine in 2018. And uh, in a primary care setting, the treatment package was found to have a statistically and clinically significant effect. I'd like to share with you one possible vision for the future of tobacco use prevention and treatment. One possibility is that interventions will become more efficient, less wasteful, and less burdensome. You can imagine that if, uh, if all inactive or counterproductive components were removed from interventions, how much more efficient they would be and how, how much less burdensome they would be to participants. Intervention adaptation can sometimes be accomplished by optimizing for individual settings by reusing data from a single optimization trial. And this gets to uh, some ideas in implementation science about adapting uh, interventions to different settings. Not, not every aspect of intervention adaptation, but well, let me share with you what I mean and you can draw your own conclusions. Suppose you conducted an optimization trial on five components um, and you got results on which components were working and which ones weren't. And and you have data on how much they cost. In one setting, uh, you are told that, uh, that it's possible to pay $300 per person for the intervention. And so you select from uh, the set of components, the set of candidate components, based on the optimization trial, the set that gives you the most effective intervention without exceeding that budget of $300 a person. And so that uh, intervention is symbolized in that, that little box there. And let's say that was components one, two, and four. Now suppose there's another setting that can only afford $200 a person. So they could not afford that optimized $300 per person intervention. If you can reasonably assume that the results of the optimization trial would generalize to that second setting, you can use those same results to optimize an intervention using that criterion. In other words, selecting the set of components that gives you the most effective intervention you can get for now only $200 a person. And of course, um, that, uh, that assumption that the results of the optimization trial will generalize to that setting, that's the same assumption you'd have to make uh, with an RCT as well. Um, now notice that in that uh, transparent box on the right, uh, 
the, the selected components are one, three, and five. And I wanna make a, a small point here, which is that when you reduce the upper limit on cost, the set of components that goes into the optimized intervention is not necessarily a subset of the set of components that goes into a higher cost intervention. I think that's an important point because it, it shows uh, another reason why it's not a good idea to do these ad hoc modifications. Simply removing components from an intervention doesn't get you the best you can get for, for the available money. I believe that progress through the NIH stages of intervention development could be accelerated in the long run if we adopted uh, a more optimization and a more iterative approach to science. I believe that we potentially could speed uh, the, the adoption of basic research findings into, uh, into interventions. And I also think that um, there wouldn't be quite as much of a cliff uh, between uh, stage three and stage four, and then stage four and stage five potentially, because interventions would be uh, much closer to being scalable by the time they got to stage five. I also want to point out that most uh, also can be used to optimize uh, implementation and dissemination procedures. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, we can uh, talk about that during the discussion if you like. Um, I believe that the iterative approach would actually help us make more scientific progress in the long run, in the long run. So let's consider 10 years, 700 research participants, and let's consider an intervention scientist who's using the classical approach and an intervention scientist who's using uh, the multi-phase optimization strategy. So the classical uh, approach scientist um, takes half the subjects, 350 subjects, and assembles an intervention out of five components, evaluates it in an RCT, and does not get significant results. In the next five-year funding period, that scientist takes the other half of the subjects, um, assembles an intervention out of five new components, evaluates that in an RCT, and happily gets a significant result. Now, let's consider what an intervention scientist using most might do. In years one through three with fewer subjects, N equals 200, this scientist uh, conducts an optimization trial, same five components. I wanna point out, notice they're both in blue, same five components. And the results are, oh, uh, this got a little messed up, I'm sorry. The results are that two of the components uh, had, had detectable effects and three did not. So then in years four through six, uh, 200 more subjects, there's an optimization trial of those five new components, same five components. And it turns out, and you can't, you can't see this unfortunately, but um, three of them uh, turned out to have a detectable effect and two did not. So now, uh, in years seven through 10, uh, the intervention scientist assembles an intervention out of the five uh, successful components, evaluates that intervention and four new components in a hybrid evaluation uh, optimization trial design. I can explain more about that if you like using 300 subjects. The result was that the new, the new intervention is successful and uh, two of the four compo new components that were uh, examined uh, had detectable effects and two did not. Now let's look at the summary of progress here. In the classical approach, the intervention scientist developed a successful intervention in 10 years, developed a successful intervention, um, but the scientist does not know that that intervention is composed of three strong components and two inactive components. So it's unknown that two components, um, it's known that two components it's, it's unknown that two components actually worked in the unsuccessful intervention and could have been kept. And it's unknown that only three components worked in the successful intervention. And the next steps are unclear. What, what, what would be done next to improve the intervention is unclear. The scientist using the multi-phase optimization strategy developed a successful intervention composed of five strong components and no inactive components. And this investigator examined a total of 14 individual components, found that seven worked and seven didn't. And the next steps are clear because uh, the intervention scientist has a few good components that could be added to the intervention and also knows the weak points in, in the intervention. 
So that's a summary of progress that could be made over 10 years, uh, same number of research participants, uh, contrasting the two approaches. If interventions were routinely optimized to achieve intervention ease, they would become better and better over time. So let's look at this quote from the NIH website. Intervention development is not complete until an intervention reaches its maximum level of potency and is implementable with a maximum number of individuals in the population for which it was developed. I agree uh, largely with this, but I, I would change one thing. I would say that intervention development is never complete because you can always, that may, that may seem scary, but you can always improve, you can always improve interventions. Um, think about consumer products. Think about uh, the iPhone, for example. Uh, in the past uh, 10 years, there have been many, many different uh, improved versions of the iPhone. They come out with uh, one or two new versions of the iPhone uh, every year. We could be doing that with interventions. There could be an expectation that interventions were going to be continually optimized and that there would be new versions of an intervention uh, being uh, released every now and then in much the same way that new software is released. There could even be version numbers uh, attached to, to interventions to show where they are in, in the optimization process. And I believe we would develop a solid foundation of knowledge about what works for whom and under what circumstances. I think this foundation would grow uh, over time. Um, I will say that in factorial optimization trials, uh, you have the opportunity to look at interactions between intervention components. That is to say, you can look at whether the presence or absence or level of a component has an impact on the effect of another component. Um, we routinely put lots of uh, components and interventions and we know very little about this. And I believe that that's one area that we really need to take a look at to help us understand how interventions work and how to improve them. Okay, a few closing remarks. I'd like to point out some environmental changes that would help the uptake of, of optimization, in my opinion. I think we could make the funding structure friendlier to an iterative approach. And again, uh, drawing from the NIH stage model, um, the stage model is supposed to be an iterative, recursive, multi-directional model of behavioral intervention development. And to me, when you talk about doing research iteratively, that means research that's in a discovery mode. So you conduct, for example, an optimization trial, and then based on that optimization trial, you decide what you're going to do next. And I think we all know that um, the way research funding is currently obtained, there really isn't an opportunity to say, well, fund me to do this study, and then after that, and then give me some money so that after that I can decide what to do next. That's not the way, uh, that's not the way funding works. And yet, that's not uh, a terribly outrageous idea. There could be ways to uh, handle that without giving a blank check to, to, uh, to investigators. For example, uh, there would still be a budget with an upper limit on the budget, of course. And then there could be a decision point built into the plan of work at, at which um, the, the scientists would have to go back to program and discuss with them the findings and what the next steps would be. Something like that would, I think, enable us to work more iteratively in developing interventions. And second, I'd like to suggest we acknowledge that optimization trials can contribute as much to science as RCTs. Um, many times in my career, uh, when I've given a workshop or a presentation about most, um, uh, a new investigator has come up to me and said, I really find these ideas exciting and uh, I want to uh, write a K award uh, uh, application uh, featuring these ideas. I say, fine, I'd be happy to be on the mentoring committee. And then I get a sheepish email a few weeks later saying, well, I ran this by my mentor and my mentor says that these ideas are just too out there. And what I really need to do is get a couple of significant RCTs under my belt. And then I can start thinking about something like this. Um, and that uh, just kind of makes me sad. Uh, and I think that 
it would be better for intervention science if we acknowledge that some people might want to make their entire careers uh, conducting well-designed, influential optimization trials, and that you know that that would be a, a valuable kind of career. So I've argued today that there are two things we need to achieve greater public health impact. One is that we need to consider affordability, scalability, and efficiency, along with effectiveness from the very outset. And I'm suggesting that we use an optimization approach to achieve intervention ease in an iterative research framework. I want to give a shout out to some of my amazing collaborators. Uh, and I, I collaborate with people in a number of areas, but in the tobacco area, of course, uh, Tim Baker, Steve Bernstein, Mike Fiore, Robin Mermelstein, Megan Piper, Vic Strecker. I think uh, these are names that are familiar to, to many or most of you. And then in my more methodological work in the development of most, um, Danny Almiral, John Ziak, uh, Billy Nayam Shani, Kate Guastafaro, Susan Murphy, VJ Nair, Daniel Rivera, Jillian Strayhorn, and David Van Ness. They've all been uh, amazing partners in, in this research. If you're interested uh, in learning more, I suggest you do not buy this book because you can download a PDF uh, for free, most likely from your university library. I wanna thank you for giving me an opportunity today to talk about my favorite subject. And uh, I'm, I deliberately uh, made this talk a little bit short because I'm very interested in hearing your comments today. Thank you very much. Linda, wonderful. Um, and uh, thank you for that really thorough review, both, both of most, but also um, I thought it was really helpful that you um, address some of the issues that particularly younger investigators face, and that is the enormous fear uh, to go out on a limb with uh, anything other than an RCT. Um, so um, I just want to uh, just really acknowledge that. I, I'm going to start with a question and then move to the questions that we're already receiving. You know, you use the the framework ease, uh, effectiveness, affordability, scalability, efficiency. Um, could you give some perspective on, um, you know, cost is a is a very straightforward one, and you use that example um, a couple times, and I thought that was really helpful. But this idea of how do you balance when making the decisions? You know, the the, the the big step away is it's not just um, efficacy or effectiveness, but we're we're almost in essence viewing these others potentially equally. How do you, um, what are some of the other considerations that you've seen individuals use most for in terms of weighing the relative um, influence or importance of effectiveness, affordability, scalability, and efficiency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you frankly, Mike, that most of the intervention scientists that I work with now are mainly concerned with efficiency. They're conducting optimization trials mostly to weed out inactive components, which is, um, you know, that, that's a, a really great thing to do. And I haven't worked very much with anyone yet who wants to do uh, kind of a, a more careful balance of those considerations. But I have a couple comments to make. One is, uh, how do you balance them? Well, you would balance them strategically. And the idea is to try to get the most public health impact. So however you would, you would do that, you want to get um, pretty much, I would say, the most effectiveness you can, but within uh, realistic limitations. Um, and I, that's uh, maybe not a, a very specific answer. It, it comes, also comes down to decision-making. Um, and I am uh, with collaborators working on um, new approaches to decision-making in most that are, uh, will, will take the results of an optimization trial and take a more Bayesian approach that will enable explicit weighing of these different considerations. I also wanna say that uh, it makes sense uh, to actually have a phase of research at the very beginning uh, 
uh, before you actually start conducting an optimization trial where you talk to stakeholders. First, you have to identify the stakeholders and then talk to them about, um, about what the limitations are or considerations from, from their perspective. And of course, Mike, um, your work has mostly taken place in uh, primary care settings. It would be possible, um, and I think you've already done some of this, to talk to um, staff in primary care settings and, and talk to them about how realistic would it be, be for you to do this? How realistic would it be for you to do that? Would this be too much? How much time do you think you could take out of the day? So staff is, is one type of stakeholder. Um, those kinds of opinions can be quantified and then used in decision-making later. Uh, thanks. Um, we got a bunch of questions coming in and um, uh, I'm going to dive into them. So um, first question to you, Linda, I'm curious about strategies for exploring participant characteristics that mm -hmm. interact with intervention components, mm -hmm. uh, optimize outcomes in the context of most. Mm -hmm. Getting at the question of for whom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's I would say is, is actually an exciting thing about um, about optimization trials, is that you can well. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can you can conduct very interesting secondary analyses where you can uh, look to see what characteristics of the individual interact with each intervention component, which of course would would uh, be really helpful if if your next step was to develop an adaptive intervention. If you already have uh, a, a sense of uh, what characteristics of the individual might interact uh, with, with components and you want to look at that empirically, you can set up the experimental design to do that. For example, to take a, uh, a let's just take a simple one. If you thought that uh, people with health literacy over a particular uh, scale score uh, would, might require uh, one strategy or that some components would work better for them, and then people below that level, some comp other components might work better for them. You actually could set up the experiment so that you recruited half people um, below that level and half people above that level. That would give you the most power for looking at, at that interaction. That tends to be resource intensive though, but there definitely are ways you can either build it into the design the way I just described, or you, conduct very, you can conduct very interesting secondary analyses. Great. Um, uh, one, one of our attendees stated, I have three components in a package, a mobile app, counseling, and NRT. I believe these are additive and synergistic. How would I do optimization research on three effective components? Well, it would depend on what your research question is, um, you say three, three effective components. If, if that means you already know they're effective, then I'm not sure um, what, the, what the question is, um, but let's assume for the moment that you wanna test them. And so in a case like that, um, you, you could, um, in a two by two by two factorial experiment, if you wanted to, you could examine uh, the effectiveness of, of each of those components, and you could you could also tell whether they interact with e with each other. I, I'm not sure whether whether that answers your question or not. Yeah, and of course, I don't have the um, uh, it, the individual who's asking it. But yeah, that's that's a disadvantage of this. this yeah, um, might an might an additional way to look at. Um, the additive um, and or synergistic effects is to use each of those elements, but at different intensities um, mm -hmm. as your, in essence, the equivalent of your on off of effects. Yes, yes, that's a really good point. You, you certainly could, um, instead of having them be on off, you could vary the intensity. And a, a few of the factors in, in the optimization trial from um, C-Tree that I showed a few minutes ago, they, some of those were low intensity, high intensity, rather than off or on. And yes, so 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 if the issue is that you don't want to withhold uh, any of the treatments from anyone, yes, you certainly can examine um, low low versus high. Great. Um, going to another question. 
especially in tobacco research where speed is so critical. Mm -hmm. The field in industry moves so fast that results of current studies are already obsolete when they um, have results available. Mm -hmm. Is there some thought about an adaptive research methodology that may address this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um, uh, I've been collaborating with a health economist, uh, Dave Van Ness at Penn State, and we are actually working on, on a, a larger Bayesian framework for uh, intervention optimization that would uh, enable the investigator to um, uh, be very, very efficient in terms of time and use of experimental subjects. Having said that, though, um, I think about the fastest experimentation you can do is with mHealth interventions, because typically uh, those, those have, they have kind of a short uh, short response lag, you, you know right away whether they're working or not for the most part. Um, and uh, they're, they're usually, you usually have access to a lot of ex experimental participants. And so it's, it's hard in a, in a more uh, primary care based setting to just to work as fast as, as people can in, in, in the M health world. But yeah, I think there are, there are ways to shorten it. Also, um, I alluded very quickly to a hybrid uh, evaluation optimization uh, experiment. And that's a, a relatively new experimental design. There's going to be um, uh, an article uh, sharing an application of that design that will come out in the Annals of Behavioral Medicine a little bit later this year. And in that design, you evaluate a treatment package by having it be one factor of a factorial experiment. And the other factors are additional candidate components that you are trying out. So at least that would shorten things a little bit because you wouldn't do uh, an, uh, an RCT evaluation, wait for that to be done, and then conduct another optimization trial. Uh, so I, I definitely hear you about wanting to, uh, to shorten, shorten the, the, the timeline here. I'm with you and we are working on that. Great. Um, what advice do you have on where to start for researchers who may want to embark or learn more about mm -hmm. using most in their intervention development? Mm -hmm. Well, first, um, you can download my book. You can download a PDF for free, as I said. Uh, so um, that, would, that book is meant to be, it's not very technical. It's meant to be a, a comprehensive introduction aimed at, um, aimed at intervention scientists and also at, at the biostatisticians that, that they work with. So that would be a start. Um, I uh, just recently moved to NYU uh, after many years at Penn State, and I'm in the process of setting up a new website there, and that should be live. If you, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll make an announcement when that's live, and that will have a lot of information on it. It will, it will um, have FAQ about most, and it will have uh, some hints for people about uh, good strategies for writing grant proposals using most. So watch for that. And uh, I have an R25 grant from NIH to develop training, online training materials uh, to help uh, intervention scientists to learn about most. So I'm in the process of developing an asynchronous online course. And then once that's developed, I'll use those materials in some synchronous trainings I plan to have a few times a year, synchronous online trainings. So there, there will be trainings available. I, I imagine, I'm hoping that the online, the online course, the asynchronous course uh, will be available, um, I would think by June. And then we will plan uh, one of the synchronous courses, um, which will be based on, on those materials, but also will involve, you know, the opportunity to ask live questions and, and some group exercises and some individual attention. We'll, we'll um, probably do the first one of those toward the end of the summer or early fall. So watch for those things. Um, I, I'll be announcing them. I'll be, be announcing them on Twitter or feel free to email me if you have questions about when things are going to be rolled out. Great. Another question. Just to clarify the relationship between most and smart. Ah, most yes. is the overall product and smart is a possible design within the process. Uh, is that it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and uh, Susan Murphy and I need to be blamed for um, not making that clear at the beginning, because actually we didn't figure it out ourselves until, until a little later. We actually um, 
we actually published an article. This was quite a long time ago now. It was probably in like, I don't know, 2007 or 2008. And the title was something like Most and Smart. Two, two different ways you could go about um, uh, developing an intervention. And then a few years later, we kind of looked at each other and said, what? You know, why, why did we think that? Most is, is definitely uh, the umbrella. It's a, it's, a, it's a comprehensive framework that includes not just um, you know, experimentation, but also development of a, um, a very detailed conceptual model. I talk about that in chapter two of my book um, and it involves uh, all the decision-making too. And uh, SMART, the, the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial is one type of optimization trial. You use the SMART and you're trying to optimize the decision rules of an adaptive, a time-varying adaptive intervention. Um, so that there's the factorial experiment, the SMART, uh, the MRT, and I, I went over uh, very quickly a number of different experimental designs for optimization trials. And, and maybe there'll be new ones that will come online, I hope. Excellent. Um, another question. Um, how does the most methodology accommodate the reality that effective components may not act uh, um, additively or synergistically? In fact, like pharmacotherapy, mm -hmm. can't individual components act antagonistically? Absolutely. Yes, they can act antagonistically, but uh, I don't think that's something to be afraid of. I think that's something to, to detect. And you can detect that uh, in a factorial experiment. Uh, um, the sign of the interaction will tell you whether the interaction is synergistic or antagonistic. Now, I, I won't say, you think of a synergistic interaction having a positive sign, antagonistic having a negative sign. Actually, that depends on how everything is coded. Um, but the sign uh, will, will tell you whether it's synergistic or antagonistic. One thing I wanna say, and this is something I go over in my book, it's, it's when you, at first you think, oh my gosh, if there's an antagonistic interaction, that's a deal breaker. You know, it's, there's no way both of those components could be in, in the intervention, but actually it turns out that's not actually accurate. Um, there are antagonistic interactions that occur sometimes just because um, maybe there's a little bit of um, overlap between two components, maybe a little bit of redundancy. So, uh, so a, an antagonistic interaction means that, that the total effect of uh, two or more uh, components is less than what you would expect by just summing up the main effects. And, and that doesn't mean that it's like a poison pill type thing. Instead, it, instead it very often means that, um, you know, component A works great alone or on average, component B works great on average. When you have A and B together, they work great, but a little less great than the sum of the main effects. And as I said, that can be due to um, a little bit of redundancy between the components. It can be due to uh, fatigue, especially if you see, uh, well, higher order interactions involving like four or five components are always really hard to interpret. And a lot of times, you know, you, you don't even try because it's, it's, you just can't get anywhere. But I believe that uh, a lot of times those, those higher order interactions are just due to uh, someone, a, a participant thinking, well, I can handle three components, but whatever the fourth one is, it's, it's just not going to be as helpful as, as the first three were. So um, just, just to reiterate, I want to say that an antagonistic interaction is not necessarily a deal breaker. And I think it's really important to understand interactions. As, as I said during my talk, I think we can only get so far with understanding how interventions work until we really start to understand interactions between components. We know nothing about that now, almost nothing, because there have been very, very few experiments that enable you to look at interactions. The RCT, it's a great experimental design. It does not enable looking at interactions at all. Helpful. All right. Um, this is a question. Has Dr. Collins considered how tobacco harm reduction led by industry solves her concerns regarding optimization without imposing costs on public uh, sector budgets. 
They automatically address scale, affordability, and efficacy since failure to do so in, impedes the, um, profits, thus their incentive. Thoughts? Well, um, I, I will say that the basic ideas that I talked about today, obviously, uh, I did not come up with. Uh, they are standard operating procedure in virtually every other field. So it's not too surprising that any profit-making enterprise would, would use these the, the basic idea of optimization. Um, in fact, um, my, here, here's an interesting thing about my life. When I go around uh, and talk to people about most, uh, I very often at, at the end of the session, somebody will come up to me after and say, you just blew my mind. People have done things like, like posted memes of exploding heads uh, on Twitter and said, I just saw a presentation by Linda Collins and on my head. But so those are people within our field of intervention science. If I tell literally anyone else about these ideas, they say, I mean, that's not how you do it already. And it's because these ideas are just really commonplace in product development, in the development of vacuum cleaners, cars, uh, supply chains, everything. They, they, these ideas just come up everywhere. So yeah, I'm not too surprised that, uh, that any profit-making endeavor would would use these ideas. I'd, I'd be surprised if they didn't. Great. Uh, another question. I'm wondering if there's been any thought into incorporating equity considerations into these optimization strategies. Um, I haven't thought about that too much. I started thinking about that just recently. Um, I think the idea of um, uh, developing different interventions for different settings potentially could be a step toward, toward equity um, because uh, you could imagine uh, for, or you could imagine, for example, um, perhaps um, different ethnic groups require a different, a somewhat different approach to, uh, to an intervention or maybe uh, some, of the, some of the same components, but maybe a few different ones to achieve the same the same level of effectiveness. And um, an iterative approach, the way I described, could be used to, to develop an intervention for any subgroup that is equal in effectiveness to you know, any other intervention. It would have to be programmatic, would have to be programmatic, and, but it could be certainly approached that way. So yes, I think that this, this has some potential in, in that direction. Great. And I'd love, I'd love to think and talk about that some more. Great. Um, uh, so I'll have this be our last question. Can you give some brief comments about how one determines sample sizes in the most framework? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's, there's kind of two answers to that, or maybe even more than two answers. One is just simply, well, th think, of, uh, think of a factorial uh, design. That's the one uh, that I know best. Um, it's really not hard to power. Uh, it's not hard to do a power analysis. In fact, it's, it's basically the same as doing a power analysis for uh, a t-test. You just take the smallest effect that you're, you can do a good back of the envelope calculation by taking the smallest effect you want to detect and pretending it's a t-test and that N is, is really close to what the overall N is going to be for, for the experiment. But I want to um, point out that we're talking about something a little bit different here. We've all been trained to think in terms of uh, what I call the conclusion priority perspective. So in the conclusion priority perspective, you set about to detect an effect. The first thing you do is ask yourself, what's the, what, what size do I think that effect is? And no matter what the size is, you power a study so that you have, say, an 80% chance of detecting that effect if, it, if it's really there at, at that size. And you have to be able to uh, draw a conclusion uh, whether you're going to reject the null hypothesis or not. And so if you can't muster the sample size to have enough power, you just don't do the experiment. Now contrast that uh, with the decision, a decision priority perspective. When you're, when you're optimizing an intervention, you're taking a decision priority perspective. Uh, and when you're in conclusion priority mode, 
If you don't reject the null hypothesis, you just say, well, we don't know. We don't know. But when you're in decision priority mode, you don't have the luxury of saying, we don't know. You have to decide whether a component is going to go into the intervention or not. You have to make that decision. And so that has some implications for power. For example, if you decide uh, ahead of time that you want your intervention to be made up of components that have at least an effect of, let's say, an effect that's small by Cohen's terms, a, a D of 0.2, say, then you power the study for that. So you're not powering it for some tiny effect that you want to detect. You're powering it for that because you're, if the effect is really smaller, you don't care what it is because if the effect is smaller, you're not, you're not going to be selecting uh, the component uh, for the intervention anyway. So it's, it's a, so I guess the two answers are one, if the, if the question is simply, how do you do a power analysis? It, that's not hard. But if the question is, what's the thought process behind the power analysis? You have to be thinking, I would say, in terms of the contrast between conclusion priority, which is what you're used to probably, and decision priority. And that's covered in chapter three uh, and four of my book. Great. Well, on behalf of SRNT um, and all of us, Linda, thank you for just a fascinating talk um, and for preparing this plenary lecture. It's been so thank great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>